Webmaster of Bamalun, or the standard bearer, depending on how you want to uh, translate the word. So we're here in front of the statue of Leonidas at Thermopylae because we want to talk about close combat, close quarter combat, martial arts, what it really means. I received multiple queries from friends, from students, from students of other people, from independent questioning what do the martial arts really mean? What are the four phases that you keep talking about in Pamukkhon? How do they relate to close combat? Because other systems simply don't have them. They don't refer to them. That's actually inaccurate because if you look at medieval Japan, you'll see that they refer to these four phases. Now, what I'm going to show you is a presentation that I made to the heads of NATO in the beginning of June 2016 where we refer to the neurophysiological criteria that are involved with these four phases and how they relate to close combat. In other words, what happens to the human animal when it engages in a fight for its life. So I'm going to walk through this presentation with you. In fact, I've narrated it and I'm going to show you the same presentation that I gave to the heads of NATO, but it's going to be enhanced with further explanations so that you can understand exactly what's going on. This presentation is entitled A Modular Approach to Neurophysiological Conditioning and Training for Close Combat. It was prepared by myself, Kostas Dervenis, Major Evangelos Tsialo Yanis, a physician in the Hellenic Army, and Lieutenant Colonel Stylianos Livaditakis of the Hellenic Air Force. Close combat may be identified as a physical confrontation between two or more persons involving armed or unarmed fighting, lethal and or non-lethal methods, or simple escape and de-escalation of the confrontation, excluding the use of firearms. From a historical perspective, uh, we say that close combat involves white weapons. All firearms in the past centuries were termed black weapons because of the use of black powder. They went bang and made a smoky cloud, so they were black weapons. Whereas melee weapons, such as swords, knives, clubs, staffs, uh, were called white weapons. Therefore, today we can say that close combat involves the potential use and or inclusion of white weapons. Now, close combat typically occurs in confined quarters on uneven ground among multiple participants. It is not a duel. As a result, there are objects in the vicinity that will cause serious trauma in the event of a fall. The environment of close combat is most certainly not that of combat sports. There's nothing safe about it. The environment of close combat is best represented in the early 20th century drawing, the meeting of the Apaches who were a street gang in Paris at the time with the police in the Bastille Plaza in 1904. Prevalent training methods used in military combatives today follow the approach made popular by combat sports. That is to say, attempts are made to enhance the endurance, speed, and strength of the combatant within a predefined framework of rules derived from contests held in a controlled environment. We don't think this is a good idea. We consider that approach to be a strategic error. Combat sport techniques and methods were derived from and for one-on-one -on -one unarmed duels under controlled conditions. The techniques derived from and for combat sports typically do not take into account the presence of melee weapons or natural weapons such as teeth and nails. And we have confirmation that our perspective is accurate because in recent years such methods have been evaluated under actual combat conditions with less than positive results. In our opinion, it is a tactical error to simply rely on an enhanced endurance, strength, and ferocity. If these were definitive factors in close combat, then the dominant species on the planet would have been the cave bear and not Homo sapiens. Close combat must be re-examined under an applicable paradigm that takes into account both physiological and psychological factors. Our proposed method is based on human physiology our neurology, anatomical constraints, and observed behavioral patterns during combat. It is also derived from nature. We ask ourselves the question, how did primitive man defeat larger, faster, and more powerful animals 
using only close combat weaponry. We can begin our analysis by outlining the physiological considerations that became the foundation of our system. The first thing we need to look at is what happens to our brain during combat. The triune brain is an evolutionary model of the human brain and its related behavior that was proposed by the American physician and neuroscientist Paul D. McLean in 1990. Dr. McLean actually began formulation and investigation of his model in the 1950s and 60s, so it took a good 30 years to put together. The triune brain consists of the reptilian complex, the limbic system, and the neocortex. This hypothesis has been challenged from an evolutionary and anatomical standpoint, but is directly applicable as a model for the escalation of violence, as we will see. Let's see if we can point out broadly where these three centers lie. So the first part of our brain, the, the outer layer, the neocortex, is what makes you, you. It's the thinking part of ourselves. Uh, it's responsible for science and technology, for forethought and logic. I call it the angel. The second part of our brain is kind of located in the center of the outer mass and wraps around the even older uh, segments of our brain, like a girdle. And that's why it's called the limbic system. Uh, from the Latin limbus, which means girdle. Um, but it is primarily concerned with pack status, how you relate to others in the human family. Uh, therefore, uh, I call it the monkey. And the scientific term would be the paleomammalian brain, which means the old mammalian brain. And if you look at it in that uh, context, it makes a lot of sense. And the third part of our brain, the reptilian complex, is that which is concerned with survival. It plays a very important role in the escalation of violence. We actually call our method the quadrant brain approach because it incorporates another layer beyond the triune brain. That additional layer is the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system comprises the enderic nervous system, which has also been called our second brain because for the first six months of our life, it operates independently of the central nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system, and the parasympathetic nervous system. We will discuss how these contribute to our physiological response in uh, combat further on in the presentation. So when it comes down to it, these are the four levels that we're discussing. The neocortex deals with analysis and escape. Let's call it the angel. The limbic system deals with pack status, dominance, and submission. Let's call it the monkey. The reptilian complex is concerned exclusively with survival. Let's call it the dinosaur. And way deep down inside of us, the autonomic nervous system involves control of our autonomic functions. Let's call it the mollusk. The next thing we need to talk about is the escalation of force. As pointed out by the United States Marine Corps in their manual on close combat, violence escalates as a continuum of force. People begin by being compliant then they become passively resistant, then they become actively resistant, then they become assaultive and finally lethal. And the progression is not a linear one, but more like a geometric progression as can be seen in this graph. So what happens when violence escalates? Well, when faced with incoming danger, the senses typically send a signal or input to the amygdala, which is a part of the limbic system and which primarily handles emotional processing. The amygdala interprets the images and sounds. If it perceives danger, then it sends a distress call to another part of the limbic system called the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is a command and control center. It's connected to many parts of the brain, the frontal lobes, septal nuclei, the brainstem, the, the hippocampus, the thalamus, etc. It regulates and sends signals through the autonomic nervous system. In a cascading reaction, the hypothalamus subsequently activates the sympathetic autonomic nervous system to send signals to the adrenal glands. The adrenals respond by pumping epinephrine, otherwise called adrenaline, into the bloodstream. The heart beats faster than normal. Pulse rate and blood pressure go up. Our breathing becomes rapid. Small airways in the lungs open wide. Extra oxygen is sent to the brain. Sight, hearing, and other senses become sharper. Epinephrine simultaneously triggers the release of blood sugar and fats from temporary storage sites in the body. 
energy supply to all parts of the body increases explosively. The hypothalamus then activates the second component of the stress response system, known as the HPA axis. It's important that we understand that the second component acts in a cascading type of effect. So, corticotropin releasing hormone, or CRH, is first released in the hypothalamus. This stimulates the release of adrenocorticotropic hormone in the anterior pituitary gland, which in turn stimulates the release of cortisol from the adrenal glands. So it's a cascading mechanism that makes sure that the body stays strong and on high alert. None of this happens slowly. The amygdala and hypothalamus can initiate reactions before the brain's visual centers have fully had a chance to process what is happening. That's why people can react to and avoid a threat seemingly without conscious thought. However, a physical response to violence can also be contained or influenced by emotion under the premise of fight, flee, freeze, or fawn, and stuck in the limbic system. So it might be that the hypothalamus itself is key to a proper close combat response. In discussing the escalation of force in our stress response to violence, we must distinguish between social combat and lethal force. Pack-related hierarchical violence or social combat refers to those circumstances where one individual is trying to subdue another. Uh, it refers to those cases where, quote unquote, one individual is trying to beat another up. When an individual is engaged in dominance-related violence, the limbic system controls the reins to the psyche. The individual's skin becomes red as blood flows outwards. He or she will try to stand taller. They will thrust out their chest. They will attempt to enter into their opponent's space. They will try to push their opponent. The individual will make large pronounced movements, throw things, shout, make loud noises. This individual is still trying to communicate while trying at the same time to establish dominance over their rival. They, are, they may be listening, for example, to their rival, but only to try to find a superior argument to them. Now, social combat can turn lethal, but when it does so, it is always in a manner so as to uh, display hierarchical superiority over the individual that has lost. When the individual is engaged in lethal force, other factors enter into play. When an individual is engaged in lethal violence, control of the psyche is moved to the reptilian complex. The skin becomes white as blood withdraws internally to strengthen the internal organs and limit damage from bruising. This includes the brain. The forebrain's blood flow is restricted. The individual will not and cannot communicate. The body shifts its stance and type of movement to prepare for lethal force, and the body becomes supercharged and super fast. Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman was the first person in recent history to address mankind's innate resistance to killing. So he resurrected historian SLA Marshall studies on World War II, which uh, from a statistical standpoint showed that the majority of soldiers in war do not ever fire their weapons and that there is an innate resistance to killing. So uh, the, U the US military after uh, SLA Marshall's uh, publication, uh, instituted training measures to break down this resistance and successfully raised soldiers firing rates to over 90% during the Vietnam War. So from our standpoint, we were curious. I mean, we have this statistical evidence and surely if uh, people were bred with this uh, internal innate resistance to killing, there had to be biological factors that uh, contributed to this or, or proved it. And that's what we went looking for. The first thing we took a look at to see if there was physical proof of this was social combat. So social combat, bar fights, submission combatives, potentially even ritual dueling with some weapons, basically encompasses male on male violence for hierarchical dominance within the pack. Social violence is a biological imperative for mating and it's not designed to kill. Why do we say that? Well, uh, throughout our existence, women have typically given birth to one or two babies. And the evolutionary model that we chose for survival was that we give birth to very smart children that are basically uh, premature. They're helpless for a year. 
we have to even carry them around. And how do you ensure uh, that uh, these babies are protected? Well, you need a lot of males. And if males are killing other males, then you don't have males to protect the pack. So therefore, social violence or social combat is uh, evolutionarily designed not to seriously injure and or kill the other individual. It makes sense. Uh, again, getting back to the alpha male and the alpha female, it was an evolutionary choice, a survival mechanism for the human animal that uh, you have a lot of couples and the, each couple has a baby in order to both ensure diversity and, uh, and the uh, amount of uh, pack members that were required for, for protection. So in fact, it makes complete sense that social combat is designed to be non-lethal. Let's see if we can prove that. Okay, anybody that's been in a bar fight knows that your first impulse is to punch him in the face. My opinion is that this is the case so as to make him less attractive to women. But uh, looking at the fist and, and this first impulse, uh, we have to raise the question is, uh, raise the question, is the fist a suitable weapon? Is it a good weapon in this case? Well, it's surprising how many punches end up in what's called a boxer's fracture which is a fracture of the fourth and third uh, or third uh, metacarpal joint. And it turns out that uh, boxers fractures make up half of all hand fractures in emergency wards. In fact, back in 1988, Mike Tyson, who I hope we will all agree knows how to throw a punch, got into an altercation on the street with Mitch Green. Tyson threw a punch. And uh, if I remember correctly, Green required five stitches in his nose and had a black eye. I recall the picture. Tyson broke his hand. So, you know, under the, this is a man that has been boxing all his life. That's a, a world champion that most certainly knows how to throw a punch. But when he did it on the street, he broke his hand. Now, what's even more scary than boxers fractures are fight bites. We'll talk about those in the next slide, but typically fight bites must be surgically cleansed within 24 hours or can result in gangrene. Okay, in this slide, you see two photos on the right hand side is an intentional bite, uh, biting being very much a mechanism that comes into play when the human animal feels that it is uh, being threatened. And the one on the left is a fight bite. Now a fight bite is an involuntary bite that happens when the knuckles of a fist strike a tooth, fight bites will penetrate into the metacarpal joints in 62% of all cases, cause injury to the tendons in 20% of all cases, to cartilage in 6%, and injury to the bones in 58%. Fight bites will not heal by themselves. They must be surgically cleansed. The reason for that is you have different layers of skin, and as, you, as the joint extends, the penetration will uh, split apart. So you, there's no clean access or clear access of outside air to the uh, whatever infection has gone into the joint at that point. And fight bites can be terrible. They, they have resulted in uh, parts of the hand being lost due to infection. And again, if you think that fight bites are not common, you haven't been in a fight. Um, this uh, diagram here shows the bites from different mammal species causing bite injuries in Australia between 1998 and 2004 by patient age. What's humorous is you can see that the human bites suddenly uh, skyrocket around when the patient age is 19, and then they gradually uh, drop off and, and go below the, the other uh, mammal bites uh, when the patient age reaches around 49. And yet we persist with instructing soldiers in techniques that were designed for social combat. Neurological programming and social memes are just that strong. Imagine what would have happened if the soldier on the right was in the field with no access to external support or help and had broken his hand, so a boxer's fracture, or had even had a fight bite under those circumstances and had had gangrene settle in. Not good is the answer. So let's review and summarize what we just said. Number one, any response to the escalation of force in the human animal begins in our emotional center. Number two, 
there may be evolutionary reasons for a staged cascading neural response to violence centering around the avoidance of intraspecies aggression and killing. Similar behavioral patterns are observed in primates. In humans, number three, sorry, in humans, the principal physical response to male on male violence, quote unquote, punch him in the face, may have evolved anatomically so as to elicit the de-escalation of violence. And the reason behind that is that we wanted more males around to protect the pack. To keep addressing things from a military perspective, we want to point out that the international law applicable to armed conflicts specifies the conditions for the use of force. Number one is the existence of a prior armed attack. Number two is the necessity of a response. And number three is the proportionality of the response. So based on advanced situational awareness training, uh, which in turn is based on the human channel capacity under stress, there are only three recognized decisions that an operator can make when faced with an anomaly to baseline behavior. Number one is contact it. Number two is capture it. Number three is kill it. Now, it was interesting that these three choices could be directly correlated to the three neural centers that would be directly involved uh, with the choices based on the level of violence that was inherent to them. So uh, this allowed us to propose a new paradigm for close combat, basically three tailored modules based on the triune brain outline and the processes involved in the escalation of force. So our first module we called uh, evasion and escape combatives. We know that the neocortex is involved with this and that had to do with the uh, tactical choice of contact it. The second level was submission combatives. We know that the limbic system is directly involved in these processes with that level of violence. So we're talking about social combat and that had to do with the decision of capture it. And the third level, of course, was lethal combatives, where we know that the reptilian cortex holds a central play that was involved with the uh, tactical decision of kill it. So what we did for the military is develop three training modules that were tailored to the specific level of violence that an operator would encounter. So for each module, specific drills and methods were developed to work in conjunction with known evolutionary neurological processes. Each module and drill was tailored to a specific level of stress with regard to the level of violence that would be encountered and its known tactical considerations and requirements. And decision-making criteria based on neuroanatomy are constantly being identified or re-identified and constantly being re-evaluated. And this strategy has in fact been extended into the Pamahon civilian training method, even with the Pamahon method that we're teaching children. So the first thing that is taught in uh, the corresponding level one, let's say, is evasion and escape combatives. That has to do with the neocortex, the outer layer of our brain, the logical, the angel, and has to do with the imperative to contact it. The second level that is taught, level two, Submission combatives has to do with what happens when the limbic system is engaged and we want to capture and control someone or something. The third level, lethal combatives or level three, is what happens when we're fighting for our lives. The reptilian cortex holds sway and we have to kill the adversary. And there is, of course, a fourth level. We call it inner mind combatives. It has to do with the autonomic nervous system. And what it teaches us is to how to control ourselves and possibly using the same principles and guidelines, how to control others when necessary. So I was told in a recent NATO conference that all this was new and innovative, but from my standpoint, what I was trying to do was to provide a scientific foundation for what I had been taught uh, over the past five decades of studying uh, classical martial arts. In fact, these four levels were present in the classical martial traditions of the East. Historically, the point of martial training was always to quote the US Marine Corps, one mind, any weapon. Traditionally then in Japanese, these four levels correspond to Shoshin, which is the beginner's mind, Zanshin, which is the aware mind, Mushin, or no mind, or the mind of the void, and Fudoshin, which is the immovable mind. In fact, these four states simply reflect the various components of our nervous system working either in conflict or in harmony. 
So when you're in Shoshin, or beginner's mind, your neocortex is in full focus. That's the proper time to teach correct movement and posture. When you're in Zanshin, your neocortex and your limbic system are working together. So posture and emotional control or emotional awareness are combined. Mushin refers to posture, emotion, and mind working in harmony. And there your, neo, your neocortex, your limbic system, and your reptilian complex are working seamlessly. And in Fudoshin, the last state, your neocortex, your limbic system, your reptilian complex, and your autonomic nervous system, or in other words, posture, emotion, mind, and subconscious, are all working together. Now, let me elaborate on this a bit further, because it seems that over the past 15 years, since the internet became the principal source of information for most people, a lot of actual knowledge has been lost. So you can see all this in how a person is standing. In fact, the emphasis on classical Japanese martial arts on kamai or stance formation, uh, there's a reason behind it, folks. Over the past 10 years, there have been multiple academic publications elaborating that 65% of all communication is nonverbal, taking place through subliminal physical cues. Now, these subliminal warning signs are only enhanced by the escalation of violence. They become signposts. They become banners. They become billboards. A person who is trained can see things from far away. And they are present at all times, even when one is only training for preparation of violence, that is to say, in sparring or in the training hall. Somebody that knows what he's doing can read right into you. He can see what you're carrying with you. So, in fact, to get back to the word kamai, in classical Japanese martial arts, it refers to the positioning of the body. And much like a strategic analyst can establish the strengths and weaknesses of a castle or a battalion of troops by studying their respective formation, so can an individual's strengths and weaknesses be judged by how he moves and carries himself. Now, I have to emphasize that there's nothing mystical about this. It's just a matter of proper training and understanding. The study of an individual's intentions and capabilities reflects understanding of subliminal cues and human neurophysiology, nothing more. And over the past decade, multiple academic disciplines have emerged in these fields. It's therefore possible to establish if someone actually has lethal intent or is simply engaging in social combat, for example, by picking up on these subliminal cues. And again, to get back to the four levels and what's involved, for level one, escape combatives, we have repetitive drills, exercises, and psychophysical conditioning through movement, focusing on escape and de-escalation. For level two, or submission combatives, we use competitive drills and contests, emotional and psychological drills, one and two and multiple on one scenarios and vice versa, all focusing on submission and control of the opponent. It's only in level three that we approach lethal combatives, uh, and there we teach historically documented and repeatedly proven techniques, drills, and conditioning methods for lethal combat. Uh, for example, training against and the proper use of close combat weaponry is one of those. Level four involves uh, autonomic processing techniques, so breathing, meditation, environmental exposure for control of autonomic functions. Uh, we have different methods. What's important though, and what I want to emphasize is that these stages, these levels must be approached in a linear process. So level one, level two, level three, level four. The reason for that is that the brain is highly neuroplastic. And if you do it in a linear manner, then you're pretty much safe because you're developing the bridges that are required for you to uh, be unaffected by increasing levels of violence. If you jump ahead or try to jump back, you might miss a level, then you have to go back and do it. And maybe these bridges won't be built correctly. Maybe they will, but most likely they won't. Again, thank you very much for your time and your patience. I'm Kosas Dervenis. If anyone would want to contact me, the best way is through the pamahun.gr website or through the Pamahun groups on Facebook. Thank you.